Hello, and thank you for uh, joining me today. I know you have plenty of choices for your last session of the conference, and I'm pleased you chose mine. Uh, my name is Rich Trouton. I am with the Apple COE team at a small boutique German software company known as SAP. <laughs> and I am here to talk to you today about how we provided the best Mac experience uh, from the Apple COE team with love. Before we get started, there's two things I'd like to mention. Uh, the first is that all the slides, speakers, notes, and the demos are available for download, and I'll be providing a link at the end of the talk. I tend to be one of those folks who can't keep up with the speaker and take notes at the same time, so for those folks in the situ same situation, there's no need to take notes. Everything I'm gonna be covering is gonna be available for download. The second is to please hold all questions until the end. If you've got questions, make a note of them and hit me at the end of the talk, but hopefully I'll be able to answer most of your questions during the talk itself. So, in 2016, Thomas Sauresic became the new CIO at SAP. And as part of his new role, he decided that SAP needed to provide not just a good experience for SAP's Mac using employees, but the best experience to be found anywhere. 2016, though, we were not there. It was not awful. What it was, was typical. The Mac environment was trying to replicate the Windows environment as much as possible. We had an internal only Jamf Pro server. That meant that we could only manage Macs that were on our internal network or who were connected via the VPN. And as soon as a Mac left the corporate network, we stopped being able to manage them. We had two separate wikis, one for IT staff and one for customers, both of which required being on the internal network or being on the VPN in order to access them. We had lots of pop-ups for everything. Everything was bound to Active Directory. And our imaging process relied on installing the OS from a USB flash drive, then running a separate script that enrolled our Macs with Jamf Pro, and then having Jamf Pro run policies to install software and configure the Mac settings. We had a bazillion local distribution points, which meant that we had a synchronization lag whenever we wanted to deploy new software. We did find one thing that was working well, though. SAP has internal communities built using Jam, and this is a secure collaboration tool. The Mac at SAP Jam community was very active and it had more than 3,000 members in 2016. So it was a natural place uh, to hold discussions and Q&A with SAP's Mac users. And as a bonus, the Jam community is accessible from outside the SAP network and it even has its own Jam mobile app. So as a first step, the decision was made to sunset the wikis in favor of concentrating content for both the general Mac community and IT technicians into the Mac at SAP Jam site. Next. Get rid of the pop-ups. Get out of our user spaces. Any future notification should use Notification Center and be as few as possible. The decision was also made to adopt new methodologies to help us respond more quickly to our community's needs and allow us to develop a more user-centric focus. So the first methodology change was to adopt Agile methods by identifying owners for the various Mac applications used at SAP and then instituting a monthly cycle of identifying changes, testing them, and deploying them. We also developed new rules for those application owners to follow, which were based on Apple's review guidelines for the App Store. The major areas of concern were to make sure that all of our apps were 64-bit, that they were properly signed, they were properly sandboxed, and don't use kernel extensions. And the second methodology change was to adopt a more DevOps-like approach, where we would start to build our own custom applications to solve our problems in place of waiting for our vendors to solve them for us. We also made our Jam Pro server accessible to the outside internet, which allowed us to manage corporate-owned Macs as long as they had an internet connection. So to help support this, we added a Jam Pro cloud distribution point hosted in Amazon Web Services. Now these changes were being made more urgent by how the Mac company's Mac population was growing by leaps and bounds. We also had an increasingly mobile workforce, where our laptop population was far outstripping our desktop population. So with Sierra's release now coming up, the team was focused on providing zero-day support and also relaunching the Mac at SAP experience for our Mac using colleagues. And as part of that effort, four new applications were developed, and each was designed to handle certain needs that we saw within the SAP Mac community. Refresh was built to be an imaging tool which anyone can use. You didn't have to wait on IT to rebuild your Mac, you just needed to have a spare machine or a colleague's machine, which you could connect to in target disk mode. Meanwhile, Assistant configured the Mac at a global level and installed all necessary software using Jamf Pro policies. 
Let's take a look at how we sold this to our users. Meanwhile, Assistant's job wasn't quite done yet. It also worked at the user level to help the user configure their Mac. Meanwhile, Signature helped to solve a problem that was often found in companies and institutions, including ours. How do you properly set up your email signature?
And the last one is one I'm actually pretty excited to discuss. As it solved a problem for us in a way which is easy for us to support and also our users to use, and that is privileges. So this tool allows our users to work as standard users most of the time because they can always request admin rights whenever they need them. <coughs> privileges is also a self-contained application without network dependencies, so it can be used anywhere at any time. And I'd also like to give a shout out to the talented members of my team who put together these videos because they made explaining how these apps work a lot easier. <laughs> now for our own team's use, we also developed icons. So this tool creates graphic files in PNG format for use with management tools like uh, Jam Pro or Monkey. Icons was also the first of our publicly open sourced applications and I was privileged to release it at last year's Penn State conference. Meanwhile, outside of the Mac platform, we were also developing tools to help us be more transparent with our colleagues. Using SAP's Fiori web application technology, we developed Apple Pies. So Fiori is a way to provide a better user experience for SAP applications built on our S4 HANA platform, and it allowed us to build a web application that, which communicates with our Jamf Pro server using the API. So here's an early version of Apple Pies, which allowed us to display certain information from our Jamf Pro server in an easy to understand format. All information here is being pulled live from our Jam Pro server, so Apple Pies is always up to date. Meanwhile, on the social media front, we revamped the Mac at SAP Jam site to help us better communicate with our Mac using colleagues. And when we hit Sierra's launch day, everything was ready. We were actually ready, I think, about three days ahead of time. Not that we're bragging. We used the Mac at SAP Jam community to let our users know that upgrading to CR on, on release day was great. We gave them clear directions on what to do to make their Macs ready to upgrade. First, go to self-service and make your Mac ready. After that, stop by the App Store and install Sierra. We used Apple Pies to show our colleagues what our Sierra adoption rate was and encourage them to upgrade if they hadn't already done it. And by the second day of Sierra's release, we'd already seen about 1,000 of our colleagues upgrade to, high, uh, upgrade to Sierra. Now, more importantly, our colleagues had access to the same data, so they could see this as well. And two months following Sierra's release, we were close to having 50% of our fleet upgraded. Now, one thing I want to note at this point is that we were not enforcing Sierra upgrades using technical means. We were enforcing them using human-centric means. In other words, we were encouraging people to go to the App Store to upgrade and we were getting this kind of adoption rate. Meanwhile, we were making changes to our Sierra build to help us be more transparent and better able to adapt to the changes that Apple was making. The first change was to remove IT's local admin account, which helped us to ach achieve two things. The first was to build trust with our users, as our colleagues knew that we would need their assistance when the help desk stopped by to work on their Mac. 
The second was to reduce our attack surface, as an attacker would no longer be able to compromise the IT account password in order to get access to that Mac. We retained the ability to manage Macs, but it was now focused entirely through using Jam Pro. And we also configured Jam Pro to not put down its own management account on the Mac. The second change was to stop using Active Directory mobile accounts and switch to using local accounts. However, we still wanted to use Active Directory for Kerberos and password management, so at the same time, we began to use Apple's Enterprise Connect to synchronize our local account passwords and provide our Kerberos ticket management. At this time, we also made the decision it was really time to retire our existing Jam Pro service, which was hosted on-premise on, on our corporate network, and set up a new Jam Pro service hosted in Amazon Web Services. So why host in AWS? Well, one major reason is to take advantage of AWS's high availability services. They've built out this high availability service. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We can simply build on, on top of their hard work. It also allows us to make our Mac supporting services accessible by SAP employees as long as they have an internet connection. It allows SAP I, uh, IT to manage SAP owned Macs as long as they have that internet connection. So all infrastructure related to the project uses Amazon's high availability technologies, including uh, S3, which is providing our storage, uh, MySQL database hosting, which is provided by RDS, um, load balancing and SSL termination is pro being provided by the Elastic Load Balancing Service, uh, Tomcat server hosting is being provided by EC2, and Memcache hosting is being provided by Elasticache. So what's it all look like? While we're using a Jamf Pro clustered setup with Red Hat Enterprise Linux VMs hosted using EC2 and a database hosted in, in RDS. So multiple VMs are configured as limited access nodes and one VM is configured as the admin console. So the VMs configured as limited access nodes are accessible from the internet while the VM with access to the admin console is only accessible from our corporate network. So this is the big picture of our setup, but let's break it down into its component parts. How are we handling administration of this? Well. The first way is, of course, through the Jampro admin console. Um, and that's it enabled on one Jampro instance in our cluster. And this instance uses a separate load balancer and DNS address than the one used for client management communication. And this separation allows the Jampro admin console to be only accessible from the SAP network. Um, communication to the admin console uses HTTPS until it hits a load balancer, at which point we're doing SSL termination. Uh, and that's handled by the load balancer and allows us to have an SSL certificate that matches the different DNS address of the load balancer. The other way we're managing is using AWS's Systems Manager, and this is a free service for managing Windows and Linux instances that are hosted in EC2. So Systems Manager's great advantage for us is that it allows us to automate our management workflows and avoid ad hoc management via SSH. So in order to use this, we've installed Systems Manager agents on each of our instances, and these agents communicate with Systems Manager via AWS's API, which uses HTTPS to secure the communication. And as an added bonus, this communication is entirely internal to AWS, it never gets uh, outside. Um, and for more information about Systems Manager, please take a look at the link on the screen. So to show an example of how we can automate our management workflows, here's a simple script that just stops Jamf Tomcat. So once converted into the JSON format used by Systems Manager, I can now run this script on one or more of my Jampro servers at once. So this can be on demand or could be scheduled. Now here's another script that's designed to check if Tomcat's running and restart it if it isn't. And I know this is hard to read, but remember, all this is available to download later. Um, once converted into JSON, this script can be scheduled to run on a regular basis to make sure that Tomcat is always running when it's supposed to be. Now, I have a number of Systems Manager documents posted to GitHub, including the ones I just showed you and they're available via the link in the screen. Uh, one of my favorites, which I didn't show, is a script for performing an automated installation or upgrade of Jamf Pro into a Red Hat compatible Linux distro. Now client management communication is handled by the Jamf Pro servers that have been set up as limited access nodes. Now similar to the admin console setup, these limited access nodes are associated with their own load balancer and DNS address. So communication to the client management nodes uses HTTPS until it hits the load balancer, which handles our SSL termination. And that allows us again to have a, an SSL certificate that matches that different DNS address. Now if a client management action requires something to be downloaded and installed on the client, it's downloaded uh, using HTTPS from a cloud distribution point which is hosted by S3. So downloads are made using signed URLs from the S3 bucket 
which uses Amazon's CloudFront service to make sure that those uh, signed URLs have an expiration date. And the expiration date helps uh, prevent those URLs from being intercepted and reused. They're generally good for only, I think, a maximum of a couple minutes, and after that, they're no good anymore. Now, hosting in S3 also allows us to not use local distribution points and use one global distribution point. So once new software is uploaded to S3, it is instantly available worldwide. Now, we use user and group information from our corporate Active Directory domain with our Jamf Pro service. So we're using Jamf's Jamf Infrastructure Manager, otherwise known as the Jim. Our Jamf Pro service is configured to send its AD queries to a Jim hosted in our DMZ rather than trying to expose our AD domain directly to the internet. I'm sure you can imagine why that would be a bad idea. So the Jim acts as the middleman for securely passing along that query information, and that helps insulate our AD domain from that bad, bad internet. Um, all data is stored in the AD domain, and it's accessed in a read-only fashion by the Jam Pro server, and nothing is retained by either the Jim service or by the Jam Pro server. Um, for more information about the Jim and how they work, uh, please see the link on the screen. So the MySQL database used by Jamf Pro is hosted by Amazon's RDS service. And hosting an RDS allows us to only be concerned with the specific database that's hosting our data. Amazon itself is handling all the various details of hosting MySQL, backing up our database for us, and as well as making that database itself highly available. So we just gotta make sure our database is working. And all the other fiddly bits, Amazon's got it. And to comply with Jamf's recommended setup for Jamf Pro clusters, Memcache has been set up using Amazon's Elasticache service. Now, this is similar to our use case for RDS because using Elasticache means that we just need to concern ourselves with make sure, making sure that our Jam Pro server is pointed to Elasticache. Amazon's handling everything else, making sure that the Memcache nodes are up, making sure that they're working and highly available. Building good infrastructure takes time, though, so the team decided that the best approach was to debut it in time for High Sierra's release. So with Sierra launched and our colleagues adopting it en masse, it was time to turn our attention to what was next, High Sierra. So as part of the development process, the decision was made in collaboration with our uh, security folks that once a new OS was released, it was going to be our only supported OS. So to help make sure that our Macs were keeping themselves up to date, the options for automatically downloading and installing Mac OS and security updates would be enabled. So our Macs would be able to patch themselves automatically. Now another change was to resolve the dilemma of giving folks admin rights or not. Our answer is to use standard users by default and ensure that the privileges app is installed. This means that our users run as standard users the vast majority of the time, but when they need admin rights, they can get it right away. Meanwhile, Apple was making some changes of their own. Now one of them was to remove support for the target disk based mode set of process that Refresh uses. So in its place, we decided to use internet recovery as it was Apple's supported method for installing the OS. We figured they probably wouldn't break that. So since Refresh is no longer installing Assistant for us, Assistant is installed as either part of a DEP-enabled setup or it's manually downloaded onto the Mac in question. So with the change to using recovery, our setup process now looks like this. So the first thing we do, and this will look familiar to anybody who's ever pulled a Mac out of a box, we go through Setup Assistant. Uh, we skip iCloud. We figured that if our uh, end user wants to enable that, they can do that later. And otherwise, we just go and click through. And uh, we generally know who this Mac is going to be going to, so we set up their account name. And this is really the only thing the technician has to get right, is putting in that correct account name. We can really fix everything else, the password, absolutely everything else. They just got to get that account name right. All right, and then after that, we are done with Setup Assistant. And we're out into that shiny new Mac experience. So now we have a shiny new Mac that doesn't belong in our corporate network at all. So how do we make it belong in our corporate network? Well, here's where we launch Assistant. We put in the asset uh, information for this computer, which is generally on a sticker somewhere, or you know, in my case, I fed in a bogus one. Um, you put in the account password. Here's the password that either the user or the technician set up as part of, uh, you know, going through Setup Assistant. <laughs> and at this point, Assistant takes over and really does everything else that's needed. So goes through, installs our various uh, certificate routes, enrolls with our Jamf Pro server, 
phones home to the Jampro server and says, what you got for me? Jampro server says, let me tell you what I got for you. I got antivirus, I got software updates, and assistant's like, you got software updates? Oh, what if they need a restart? Assistant's like, I got this. You install them, then I'll reboot, I'll come back to where I left off, and I'll pick back up. Oh, you got Office for me, I'll install that too. Printer drivers, got them too. Additional software, a little vague there. <laughs> um, last but not least, got to make sure everything's working right, so we run some system tests, finish up. And at this point, installation's finished, got a very clear message about that. And we have two options at this point. If you leave it too long, the Mac automatically shuts down, or you can restart it. And the reason for the shutdown is that this way a technician can just walk away. If, it, if he comes back and it's shut down, he knows he can now stick it into that chipping box for that new person who lives like 500 miles away and just send it off to them. Because what happens when that person boots up the Mac for the first time is that assistant kicks off again. And similar to what we showed in the, uh, the refresh demo, here's the current version of assistant. So we're selecting our time zone. I'm setting this machine up for me. I live in Maryland, so I'm gonna go ahead and select America, New York. Everything else looks right. All right, let's hit continue. It's got my username filled in. I'm gonna put in my uh, email address and my password. And it's gonna use those credentials to set up various things for me, not just my email, but also things like file vault and anything else that I need to have that would require my credentials. I'm gonna choose mail and Safari. It pulled down my uh, profile picture from Exchange. And it goes through, sets up my account, sets my desktop background, configures my dock. Everything at this point is ready to go. So along with launching support for High Sierra, we were also launching our new Amazon-based Jam Pro service. So to help us avoid bringing legacy configuration over to the new infrastructure, the decision was made that this new infrastructure was going to support only Macs running High Sierra. Now as part of that, our, Jam, our legacy Jam Pro server would remain up for a few months in maintenance mode while we trans transition folks from running uh, Sierra and earlier to high Sierra. And once that task was accomplished, it would be retired. And I'm happy to say that we did that a couple months back. So when we, when we hit high Sierra's launch day, everything was ready to go, and we were again able to provide zero day support. Now we had a few issues with 10.13.0, I'm sure most shops did. But overall, we are in good shape thanks to our extensive testing and development work. We used the Mac at SAP Jam community to let our users know that upgrading to High Sierra on release day was approved by IT. We also had made the upgrade process even easier, as the only thing that was needed was to go into Apple's App Store and install High Sierra from there. Now, to help folks with that, we put an Upgrade to High Sierra button in our self-service. Unlike the Sierra release though, all that button did was it opened the App Store to the correct page to download and install High Sierra. Thanks to the work done during Sierra, no other configuration was needed to make uh, SAP Max ready for uh, High Sierra. Our new Jam Pro server also launched successfully at the same time and started being populated with first hundreds and then thousands of new High Sierra Max. We did have one casualty of our move to Amazon though. Apple Pies was built to talk for talking to a uh, Jam Pro server on our corporate network. It took a little bit of time to figure out how to communicate with our new cloud-based Jam Pro server out in Amazon Web Services. So while we worked on getting Apple Pies back online, our high Sierra rollout continued. We implemented our shipping OS as a supported OS policy and made the announcement that as of November 27th, high Sierra was now required for all Mac users. Now for our folks running Sierra and earlier, we made a change to self-service so that all they could see were the options to upgrade and an explanation of why they couldn't see anything else. However, for those who remember, our announcing that High Sierra was required on the 27th had some unfortunate timing because this showed up on the 28th. However, thanks to our social media efforts, we were able to get the word out quickly to our colleagues about what to do about this issue. We also continued ahead with having High Sierra as our only supported OS. That policy served us well, along with the decision to enable auto updates for Apple software when the existence of Meltdown and Spectre were announced. Apple released updates for High Sierra first, which meant that our Macs were well on their way to being remediated, while other organizations needed to wait and see if Apple was gonna release updates for Sierra and El Capitan. Now to aid us with our social media efforts, we also introduced our new spokes emoji, Hanna Fiore. 
How, uh, show of hands, how many people have never heard the phrase spokes emoji before? Now you have. <laughs> so, named for SAP's HANA and Fiori platforms, HANA Fiori now shows up in many Mac and SAP official communications. HANA helps keep us fun and helps us to grab the attention of our colleagues. And so far, she's doing a great job on both counts. She even has her own Twitter feed. We also fixed Apple Pies, which meant that our Mac using colleagues could once again see how the adoption of the new OS was going. Despite high Sierra's issues, our adoption rate was going up even faster than it had been for Sierra. We were also discovering that our earlier design decisions allowed us to dodge some bullets that were causing headaches for other organizations. One such had to do with a new account attribute called a secure token. On High Sierra APFS boot drives, a secure token must be added to any account which is being enabled for File Vault. Now, in order to provide a secure token to a user account, the account you're using needs to have a secure token as well. If no user account on the Mac has a secure token, then the first user account to log in at the login window will be granted a secure token. Now, this will occur either at the account's creation or when File Vault is enabled. Now, thanks to our now standard practice of using local users created by Apple's GUI tools and only setting up an account for the Mac's primary users, we were now following Apple's consumer model for account creation. And based on our observations of how secure token works, the consumer model is the one that has the least problems with secure token management. And in turn, that meant that we have had minimal issues with enabling File Vault on high CR Macs. Another issue was how to deal with imaging. Apple's introduction of Apple file system boot drives also introduced confusion as to whether or not Apple still supported traditional ASR-based imaging at all. But now that we're using Apple's recovery as the way to install the OS, with Assistant providing setup and configuration as a post-install action, we didn't have to care about what was going on with imaging. By re using recovery, we were now following Apple's consumer model for OS installation. As with Secure Token, our observation has been is that the consumer model is the one where Apple focuses its attention in testing. And we did have issues with user-approved kernel extension loading. But even there, we'd started to address that issue a while back. So as part of our existing guidelines for internally built applications, we had rules forbidding the use of kernel extensions. Now, those guidelines also applied when evaluating third-party solutions, which use kernel extensions. So while we were not able to be 100% kernel extension free when High Sierra launched, our users that used, our vendors that use kernel extensions heard about it from us as an important issue that may cause us to take our business elsewhere. So from 10.13.0 through 10.13.3, we leveraged Apple's design decision to have MDM disable user approval for kernel extensions. For 10.13.4 and later, we have deployed a whitelist profile with the option for users to approve the uh, loading of kernel extensions. All the while, we've been engaging with our vendors to let them know two things. The first is that we would not be buying or approving any new tools that use kernel extensions. And the second was that we were actively looking at alternatives to their products that did not use kernel extensions. So another area of concern was with 32-bit applications. So this was another area where we applied our guidelines when evaluating third-party solutions. We're not 100% 32-bit free on High Sierra, but we are working to get there. Now, as we all know, being a Mac admin is a job that doesn't sit still. So what are we up to now? Well, we recently welcomed the 9,000th member of our Mac at SAP online community. As with other shops, we're gearing up to support Mojave. And as we did with High Sierra, once Mojave ships, it's going to be our only supported OS. And our team has also received more responsibilities. We started 2018 as the Mac COE team. We are now the Apple COE team. So our responsibilities for managing SAP's Macs haven't changed, but now we'll be managing these other Apple devices as well. So let's take a look at what we're doing for tvOS. So as you can see from the Jamf Pro 9 self-service, we made this video a little while ago. But what we did was we put in the self-service, let's turn that down a little. Um, we put into self-service a way to allow someone to connect an Apple TV and configure it themselves. So the first thing you do is you go into self-service and it tells you that I can't find an Apple TV. Can you pair it? 
Apple provides a uh, pairing binary um, within High Sierra that we took advantage of. And basically what we're doing is we're connecting to our Apple TV via Ethernet, putting in a code so that the Apple TV knows to trust the, uh, the High Sierra Mac that we're running from. And at this point in the background, what we're doing is we're telling the Apple TV, all right, here's our Jam Pro server. Go and roll yourself. But the Apple TV is told, oh, okay, I got to go and roll myself a Jam Pro. It goes, it does it. And this is another thing we're having um, our Jam Pro server out in AWS paid off for us because that means that no matter where you are, even if you're at home and configuring Apple TV, this process works. So after a few minutes, it has enrolled itself in Jam Pro and it's pulled down a configuration. We skip a lot of the uh, issues in the Apple TV setup assistant. Last but not least, how else are we going to configure an Apple TV? Well, say hello to Assistant for tvOS. So we launch Assistant. And first thing we're going to get prompted for is what do you want to call your Apple TV? Critically important. Next, where's your Apple TV located? Put in your building and uh, room code. And this was put together by uh, my colleagues in Berlin, so that is where they were setting it up. Last but not least, do we want to configure this as a conference room display? Because that right now is the focus for our Apple TV deployment. We want to be putting them into our conference room. We want to be setting them up for easy airplay. So at this point, the Apple TV is configured to go into conference room mode, and it's really hard to get it out because that's the management that it's getting from our Jam Pro server. And I do have one last surprise. So last year at Penn State Macadam, it was my honor and my privilege to be able to open source the first of our uh, applications called Icon. This year we're doing it again. And I'm happy to announce that we are open sourcing privileges as of today. There's where you get it. It's up on GitHub. I'm gonna leave that up on the screen for a second. But keep in mind, this is also gonna be included in our slide deck. Uh, so that this link is going to be available in both PDF and Keynote format. We also have, uh, along with the application itself, we're including a sampled launch agent that allows an admin user to be automatically changed to a standard user on login. This is using Privilege's uh, command line interface. So as soon as you log in, if you're an admin, boom, you're back to being a standard user again. Auto package recipes are also available for it, and these are live now. So you can start incorporating this into your workflows as soon as you like. I do not have a monkey recipe for this. Pull request accepted. And uh, Privileges is even Mojave ready with full support for dark mode. <laughs> and with that, here is where downloads are available. PDFs are available via the link on top. Keynote slides where you can get all the slides, all the demos, all the movies, all the everything are available via the link on the bottom of the screen. And with that, I'm going to open the floor for questions. Ah, all right. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna try to toss this. My apologies in advance. Yay! So what does Mac COE stand for? Okay, so COE stands for Center of Excellence, which sounds incredibly immodest. It is an SAP internal term for a specialized team. So we are the Mac Center of Excellence. Now we are the Apple Center of Excellence. And, um, you mentioned you, you guys were supporting uh, iOS versions like iOS and tvOS and watchOS. What are you guys doing for uh, iOS? So for iOS, and I'm 
happy I'm actually able to talk about this now because uh, if you'd asked me a week ago, I would have been like, I, I can't talk about that. Um, so for a long time, um, we have had a internally built MDM solution, which is SAP Afaria. SAP Afaria uh, has gotten a bit long in the tooth, so the decision was made that we needed to get another solution in place. Um, so we are going to start using, uh, transitioning to using Jamf Pro to manage our iOS devices. So in addition to using Jamf Pro to manage our Macs, in addition to using it for Apple TV, we're also now gonna be using it for iOS. And presumably if we ever get to the point where we can manage watchOS, we'll probably be using Jamf Pro to manage watchOS too. How do you train your user community to take the time to make uh, to do reboots and make sure that uh, patches are applied? Well, this is where, since we're using Apple's own built-in uh, update management service, there's this little thing that pops out and says, hey, you've got updates that need a restart. When do you want to restart? Do you want to do that now? Do you want to do that in an hour? Do you want to do that like later? And it'll keep bugging them. So that's how we do it. This is regarding, um, I guess deployment and first time setup for users when they're using Assistant. Um, I guess two questions. First, are you are you deploying any remote users who are not in the office or on the corporate network? And if so, how are they offing into your internal Active Directory for things not regarding Jamf? So in the Assistant app, they off with their AD credentials, and I did see your Active Directory was behind a firewall. Yes. So how we are managing that is that. Um, we are using local users, but in terms of like uh, logging into, uh, you know, like for our email and things like that, we're using Exchange Web Services. So that's accessible to the outside. We're able to use that to, uh, you know, configure things um, and also make sure our password is correct and everything else. So that's what we're using in that case. We're using Exchange's services. Uh. I noticed that you got rid of a local IT admin account, but you also mentioned that you got rid of uh, the Jamf service account. Uh, how does that work? Um, you okay. don't, you don't uh, unless you're using Casper Remote, you have zero need for that management account. You do not. So we don't use Casper Remote for various reasons, so we got rid of it, and that works just fine. Uh, yeah, but we're, we're not generally doing that. But you can also do that using, uh, well, not on APFS right now, but on core storage, you could do that using just the uh, recovery key, which we are escrowing recovery keys. So with the ability for users to give themselves admin rights, either indefinitely or some um, period, of finite period of time, um, is there any kind of, you said it worked offline, so they don't need to even be on the internet at all, if I heard correctly. Right. So is there any, does your InfoSec team say, well, why does Bill always need admin rights? What is he doing? Um, or is there any kind of logging to make sure that they didn't do something you wouldn't want them to do, why they had those admin rights? Well, we worked closely with our security team to come up with this model. Privileges is a compromise. But our, we, I know this is gonna sound shocking, we have a lot of developers. Developers need admin rights for a lot of the things they do. So rather than run 100% of the time with admin rights, they're now running maybe 10% of the time with admin rights. And for our security folks, they're like, that sounds like a win to me. So is there any monitoring like that? Uh, I'm gonna defer that question. Um, I will say, however, that uh, because we are a European-centric uh, company, we do have to deal with a lot of uh, EU uh, privacy laws that may not apply in the United States. Thanks for your talk, it was great. Um, I'm wondering about what the failure rate of text typing the usernames uh, during provisioning is. <laughs> Our technicians are not 100% right, I'll just say that. Uh, and we have definitely seen that where like folks show up with like names other than the ones that are supposed to be there, like people showing up with their username set to setup um, and other things like that. Our uh, field service coordinators, who are the folks that keep an eye on this kind of thing for us uh, and liaise with the help desk, they keep an eagle eye on that. And if they see that, they're like, who set up that machine? Let's go talk to them and basically be like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> um, it, 
it's a, it's a problem that is evergreen, but we try to uh, fix it as much as we can with love, patience, understanding, and the occasional glue stick. Do you have uh, in-house developers that made all the apps, or are you making, or are they Objective-C, Swift, whatever? Uh, we, so the apps that I called out uh, were all developed within our team. We have a very talented uh, developer. His name is Mark Thielman. Um, Apple Pies was developed by a colleague of mine also on our team named Laura Rosler. Uh, and in large part, the apps that I called out, they were all developed in-house by us. But of course, we do have, uh, outside of our team, we do have other developers that are um, developing other Mac applications used widely within SAP. Those are not part of our team, but we coordinate with them in our monthly release train setup, where the idea is that you give us a new version, we put it through, you know, we work with you to test it out, make sure everything is working properly, and only after that point, after it's been tested and we've made, and we've made sure that it's working the way it's supposed to, does it get released to our user population. And that's one of the reasons why we developed our rules, so that we could have something to hand to those internal developers and say, this is what you need to follow. If you do not follow this, you're not making it into the release train and you're not making it onto our user's desktops. Hey, you had mentioned uh, you were using um, Apple Enterprise Connect for uh, Kerberos authentication. Um, is there a particular reason why you went with uh, that as opposed to something like, uh, say, Nomad? Uh, at the time, <laughs> Nomad did not do everything we needed to do. We also use Enterprise Connect for, we use a lot of uh, certificate-based authentication, and Enterprise Connect helps uh, talk back to our uh, certificate authorities and get that in place. It, we're always open to looking to new solutions, but for right now, Enterprise Connect is doing what we need. I, I do not know. It does not sound like it is working. Anyway, uh, oh, there question, we go. Is there a reason why you force users to update to the latest OS right away, not waiting until like incremental release, like or at least the first patch? Well, I will c call back to what happened with uh, Spectre and Meltdown because we knew our folks were on the latest OS. Uh, we knew that remediation was gonna happen quickly. So also it's largely because as soon as a new OS comes out, that's where Apple's focus is. They're not focused on supporting old, I mean, they're doing, they're still doing some support, but Apple's focus is on the new hotness and so is ours. All the way in the back. <laughs> I was wondering if you, you know, with a lot of mobile devices, I was wondering if you were providing any kind of backup services or whatever so that people didn't inadvertently, you know, have a possibility of getting data either manual or automatic. Yeah, um, that is something that we are continually looking at. Right now, our backup method is OneDrive. If you care about your data, stick it in OneDrive. Um, we're also looking into, is there something more that we should be doing for more formal backups? Um, right now, that's an ongoing conversation. No decision has yet been made. Also, uh, if anyone wants candy, still free candy up front. Yeah. Yay! Um, I was actually just curious, uh, and uh, you know, you could answer this, or maybe someone else can. Uh, how are you guys dealing with um, uh, uh, computer upgrades, where you, you, you know you have to move the user data from one computer to the other, mm -hmm. and maybe applications and all that? We have an existing process for that, uh, which we have documented up on our jam site. Uh, we use Migration Assistant. We're using local users. We're not doing AD binding. So, I mean, Migration Assistant is a, a natural fit for that kind of workflow. Hi, Rich. Um, quick question. I work in higher education, and while I admire your setup with self-service, I cannot help but uh, think that 
Wi-Fi had uh, re refresh self-service or uh, OS install self-service, that I would have a rebellion on my hands, that some, some uh, users uh, cannot be bothered to install updates, let alone uh, tie their Mac to a co-worker's Mac and do a refresh themselves, install the OS themselves. Do you get any such feedback from your clients and how do you handle it? We treat our users like adults and we expect them to be able to handle adult things. Oh, oh, you okay? Okay. Quick question, I don't know if you um, went over this and I was missing, but for the privileges app, um, is there like an indefinite like time? So like if say if someone is um, adding apps is 24 seven, is mm -hmm. that an option as well? Absolutely, yeah. So I mean what you can do is uh, for one thing, you, in that case just don't have our launch agent that takes away admin rights and then it would just be launch privileges. If it asks you if you want to be an administrator, you say yes and then that's it. Okay, and then one follow up question. Um, so let's say a user selects to have admin rights for two minutes. After that time expires, will it automatically lock or does this person actually have to lock it themselves? After that, after that time expires, the admin rights go away. Okay. But your, your default value is to let them do it in a manner you control on off the time to one is not. That's correct. The timed one is an option that would be by, by clicking the dock icon, but if you just launch privileges and say, I want administrator rights, Unless there's something else that you have, like our sample launch agent that takes away those admin rights, those admin rights stay around for forever. But like you said, that on a reboot, it automatically takes it away, right? If you have our launch agent in place. Okay. If, if you don't have our launch agent in place, your admin rights remain. Right, okay. Yeah, it's a very flexible setup. Okay. I actually have a, a follow-up question uh, to the upgrade. Um, do you deal with any issues uh, when you use Migration Assistant uh, with the, the MDM profiles and simulation profiles also getting transferred over, or does uh, that tend to be skipped over? That is something that our uh, help desk te technicians occasionally struggle with. Um, it is supposed to, uh, there is supposed to be a fresh enroll into our Jampro server, which pulls down a fresh set of uh, MDM profiles. Um, yeah, every once in so often we see that not work the way it's supposed to and we just kind of deal with it. I mean, it, we have it set up so that uh, we can see if a machine hasn't checked in for so many days. And at that point, you know, you, normally at that point the users let us know because self-service isn't working or this isn't working or that isn't working. Because um, among other things that uh, we have, um, we have various services that are dependent on our Jamf agent up and working properly. And if it's not up and working properly, you can't get in or get on our network or do various things. So there's pretty quick feedback if our Jamf agent isn't working. Uh, just a quick question, maybe I missed. Uh, you don't use DEP? We are using DEP, um, but this is one of those issues where being a, a worldwide company kind of comes into play. We need to have set up workflows for both DEP and non-DEP because we're in more countries than DEP is presently. It's an ongoing conversation with Apple. <laughs> I may have had that conversation very recently with Apple. <laughs> Anyone else, any more questions? Comments, queries, all right. You showed your numbers for adoption for the different versions of the Mac OS. I'm curious in your organization, is it a mostly a Mac shop or do you have a large percentage of Windows users as well? Not that you're managing them, just curious about the culture. We have a large population of just about every computer platform you can think of. So we have a lot of Windows users, we have a lot of Mac users, we have a lot of Linux users, um, we have a lot of Android users, we have a lot of iOS users, we have, I mean, you name it, we've got it. What would you say the split is between Windows and Mac OS, if you can say? Uh, that is a good question, because like I said, we also have a substantial por portion of Linux users. Um, so we have about, I want to say about 85,000 employees. Right now we have around 17,000 Mac endpoints out there. 
you know, of course we have people that have more than one Mac. We have people that have just one Mac. Um, but that's how many Macs we're currently supporting. Uh, our Windows population is larger. I don't have the numbers on how much larger, uh, but that's, uh, our Mac population, as you saw from the graph earlier in the, in the talk, has been growing by leaps and bounds. I think uh, when I came on board in 2017, we had about 14,000, and now we have 17,000. So it's definitely a growing platform within our company. Is it what? Two platforms Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. Ask you know, you know when someone comes on board, it's like, what do you want? Uh, any plans to open source any more of these applications? <laughs> we have plans to open, to continue our open sourcing efforts and give back to the community. I cannot comment on future release plans. Someone has. Any other questions, comments, uh, interpretive dances? Yeah. <laughs> uh, do you have a similar process for Windows users and Linux users, um, like self-service or management for Windows and Linux? Um, we do have a so, so we do have we have a ton of home users. Like we have a ton of folks who work from home. So we do have a. Uh, it's not similar in method but it's similar in goal for you know folks getting up and working on both windows you know i for windows i've seen it for linux i haven't because when i first started on board um even though i was with the mac coe team i was hired to be on an entirely mac team of course what did they ship me they shipped me a lenovo laptop <laughs> so my initial setup and getting onto the sap network was via this lenovo so i got to see the windows setup and i thought it was pretty good um, and it was definitely focused to help you with, uh, you're a home user, you're off the corporate network to get you onto the, uh, corporate network and, you know, up and working. So it went bad. Another question I have is, so you're, I, I see the, the motivation for trying to stay on the current OS because that's where Apple's focus is. And so you're trying to stay in lockstep with them as best you can. Do you guys struggle with, well, we want to do this, Apple wants us to do this, but vendor X isn't on board and their apps aren't ready, or do you just work to try to get those out of your environment so you can stay current? We work with our vendors to basically get them on board with our vision. And uh, we have had some very pointed conversations with vendors on basically, you guys need to shape up. Um, or else you, we may not be your customer for much longer. So in those kinds of things, if the choice is between what Apple is doing and what the third party vendor is doing, we're gonna be like, this is where Apple's going, this is where we're going, you need to go there too. Okay. Was there a hand? Someone else had a hand? Question? Bueller? <laughs> yep. Over here. No. Two questions, Rich. Um, the, the one's more mundane because you know where I come from. What, what about malware um, and any uh, efforts that you make towards mitigating or identifying that risk? So in that case, what we have is, um, of course, we're trying to lock down things as much as possible. We d our remotely accessible services are turned off. Um, you know, it, we were managing things through Jamf Pro uh, we also have our security team that's monitoring for things. Uh, we are using McAfee for anti-malware. Um, we are actively looking at ways to uh, see what we can do about the fact that McAfee is both a 32-bit app and has tons of kernel extensions. Yep. Um, but you know, it, we do our best. And largely what we focus on is keeping ourselves up to date as much as possible because that if you talk to security experts that's their number one thing patch 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 the other is the question what's it like having infinite cash <laughs> <laughs> when it happens i'll let you know i do not have infinite resources i wish i did i don't know that stuff looked like you're pretty close to infinite <laughs> that's quite polished work there um, I have some extremely talented members of my team who are very good with both iMovie and with Final Cut Pro. Any 
Any more questions, comments? Come on, now's the time. Yes. Uh, sir, with the blue box sitting next to you, would you mind tossing it over this way? So you're not using Casper Remote. What are you using, if, especially if you've got a diverse population that's all over the world, people not on the corporate network, they're at home, for remote support? We're using Team Viewer. Oh, uh, you said patch, patch, patch. What are you doing for like third party applications and things along that line? Wherever possible, we're enabling the auto update mechanisms. So for Firefox, it updates itself. For Chrome, it updates itself. For Microsoft Office, it updates itself. Do you, as a follow up, do you have like a, a list of apps that you target specifically, knowing that it's kind of like a never ending battle? Uh, could you be more specific? Yeah, so do you say we're gonna make sure that Chrome, Firefox, Adobe, certain applications are always patched knowing that users can still install applications that you wouldn't necessarily be aware of? It's a trade off. Okay. Yeah, we do. It's one of those things you're gonna do your best. Security is never, ever, ever gonna be 100%. I mean, the most secure box is the one that you have uh, you know, turned off, put in a safe, encased the safe in concrete, and then thrown it off the pier. So that's a very secure computer. Is it very useful? No. Uh, hang on one second. Uh, Dimitri, the box is coming your way. Hey! Do we enforce EFI passwords? And yes, no, why? We have File Vault. Are you asking if we enforce firmware passwords? Yeah. No, we have File Vault. Okay. Yeah, so. admin rights yeah. Our, our users can get admin rights when they want. So, um, uh, also we treat our folks like adults and we expect them to live up to adult expectations. If you, if you can't give your users admin, what can you do with that? Security? Yeah, I would say, yeah, if I was, if I was supporting a, uh, a school full of literal children, um, I, that's probably when I would be looking at things like implementing firmware passwords and everything else. But for everything else, honestly, you turn on File Vault and that takes care of most of the threats. I'm not trying to protect my users from themselves. I'm trying to protect them against other people. Yes. Uh, a lot of what I'm hearing here sounds uh, kind of like you're, you're pulling in the exact opposite direction of a traditional corporate management structure. Uh, will you be doing a talk next year on how we might uh, sell a, a similar concept to what you're talking about here today uh, up our chain of command? Because uh, this, this sounds a lot like a lot to me, like like the way we should be going with this and uh, a, a more corporate uh, a more traditional corporate uh, structure uh, uh, might be a, a hard sell. To that I have to say that this is the advertisement, that this is, um, we're supporting 17,000 folks around the world. We are doing this within the confines of a very large multinational corporation um, who is not just geographically diverse, but also ethnically diverse, linguistically diverse. I think we have privileges translated into seven languages. So I'm not saying our model is gonna work for everybody, but it does work for us and it does work at our scale. So if someone's like, well, I don't know if this is gonna work, for us it does. Now, does that work for you? I don't know. But we are a signpost that says it can work at our scale. Uh, Mr. Wiesenbaker. I jump in front of him? Yeah, jump in the front. Uh, it's up to Josh. Uh, without giving away trade secrets, can you tell how many, what a staff count you have to support the 17,000? Uh, hmm. I don't know, it's a fuzzy We, we recently added some people, so I'm actually a little, uh, little vague. Um, I wanna say we have about 15 people at this point to support our social media efforts uh, to support uh, Jamf Pro, to support uh, our field service coordinators who are our liaison. Um, yeah, it's, it's about 15 at this point. But in terms of like, for example, who's running our Jamf Pro infrastructure, uh, I'm handling our infrastructure duties. And I have a couple of colleagues who handle things like uh, putting up our policies, 
and uh, you know, figuring out solutions to some of the problem, some of the issues that we face that we can put out in self-service for our users and technicians to use. Yep, go ahead. Art, um, as you know, I just came off a little more than a decade at Apple in the enterprise group, where I've been spent the majority of that time talking about this exact this because you know this is the way Apple does their IT as well. And coming off the back of that, that uh, every time I've ever seen anybody implement this, that anyone ever took me up on it and not just ran me out of the room as a crazy person, um, they end up talking to everyone they can find to listen to them about how much better it's made their deployments and lives and their users happy. Yes. So I'm very happy to see it works for you as well. And like you said, it doesn't work for everybody. There are places it doesn't work, just right. for whatever reason. But if you can deploy with this sort of thing, my experience has been if it does, if you think it'll work in your environment, that it makes so much of what has proved challenging in the past much, much less challenging and much easier as far as user and IT uh, uh, satisfaction and productivity. Yeah, we've we've had a we have uh, since we have an ongoing conversation with our users via the Mac at SAP Jam site, we get very direct communication with our users and very honest communication. They tell us exactly when we're doing things right, and they tell us exactly when we're doing things wrong, sometimes repeatedly. Um, so we have so one of our huge focuses is maintaining that trust and even building it up even more with our community because once you have that trust, when you ask something of your user community. They'll do it. If they don't trust you, forget it. But a lot of our thing has been, we're being transparent, we're showing you what's going on, um, and we're trying to be as open as we can with you. Please help us out as well. Yeah, and that's what I always found. And I always told people, one of the slides I had was that trust given is always returned. It is, So yeah. And it make, being partners is far better than standing in opposition. It's really, it really is. They're it's, one of us. If you notice, a lot of the times during this talk, I called our user base my colleagues because that's how we view them. You know, they're just doing a different job. Do you foresee that there would be an, a time where your security people would be con would be happy with the built-in OS security tools? Maybe if there's a more logging and reporting. That's an ongoing conversation we've had, um, where we've discussed internally what. Uh, can we go it with just Apple's built-in tools? Do we still need third-party utilities to do some of the things that we do? It's an ongoing discussion. It hasn't been resolved, but that is on our radar. And uh, you know, it, if we figure it out, I'll probably be talking about it during a future talk. Yeah, because it, that, that security software with all the kecks and the performance hits, and as, as David can tell you, the oh, here are these seven agents you have to put on your system before your management yeah. tool and AV, and <laughs> it's just a bad. Really poor. We're not doing experience. that. We're not doing that. Uh, in in fact, we uh, we we recently had someone from our uh, uh, from another department come and basically be like, "Hey, we're rolling out this new tool on the Windows side. Could you toss it on the Macs too?" And we saw a kernel extension. We're like, "Nope." And if anything, our information security folks are even more hard nosed about no kernel extensions than the team is. Um, our we have a very good relationship with information security, and they're just like, "No, no, no kernel extensions. Get rid of them." Every one of those things that runs with the kernel extension is essentially a rootkit in your system that can be. Yeah, but and it also helps make your system, assuming someone built the kernel extension right, it still has unprotected access to your memory. Correct. So if it messes up, boom, your yeah. system's down. I remember two years ago being here and having to deploy an emergency semantic patch because they had exactly that problem with mm -hmm. Atos Orbin. If you, if you talk to uh, a lot of vendors, they say top people work on their kernel extensions, and sometimes I'm just not convinced. Top men. Yeah. Top people. Yeah. Top people. Uh, yes. And we're down to seven minutes. Uh, if you don't mind me asking, uh, what are you doing to ensure software license compliance internally, given that you've got this huge distributed uh, group of people? We have an entire software licensing department that's outside my team. They use our Jam Pro server uh, inventory, which they access via the API. Um, and uh, they will follow up with our users if indeed that, that they're out of compliance. So. For, we do have that, unfortunately, tracking down people to say, you need to buy that license is not my job. <laughs> okay, but, but it's basically something that 
that pulls data from Jamf into some custom tool you have exactly. that feeds that right. to your okay. right. Any more questions? Six minutes remaining. Get them in now. Oh, over here. Um, so uh, you have a lot of applications automatically updating. Mm -hmm. um, you said Office, Chrome, Firefox, even the OS. Have you ever sort of been burned by uh, an auto update uh, and having to roll that back? Uh, and if not, do you have a backup plan in place to roll that back with so many computers that you're managing? So the answer there is going to be, we took a look at what the risks were involved of bad patch versus getting compromised because we hadn't applied a patch. And in our judgment, the risk of getting, you know, having a bad day because of a bad patch is much, much lower than having a bad day because someone was able to exploit a vulnerability that hadn't yet been patched. So our answer to that is gonna be for something like Firefox, uh, you know, see if you can maybe track down that old version of Firefox, but for the most part, we're just like, no, we just accept that risk. Thank you. Long distance. Hey, yo. Oh, oh. So close. You okay? <laughs> Do you ever have a situation where, say, your developers are using customized software that has to run on a specific OS, and did you ever get pushback about that? And if so, how did you handle that if you're requiring people to update to the latest? So for those situations, um, our developers should have uh, test machines that are running that specific OS version. Um, we have gotten some things like that. Uh, fortunately, since we do have licensing for VMware, we're often able to tell folks, if you have the OS installer, which you should because you guys are very concerned about running this OS version, um, set up a VM. But their primary, their primary work machine, that should be running the shipping OS. Um, Dimitri, I think you have another question that I can't quite hear. If so, would someone mind tossing the box up? And add to this question, what if it's like Adobe users, for example, we had some complaints about Kai Sierra, and like, for example, we cannot test everything, like we have retouchers team, right? and when they work and they find, oh, this particular feature is not working in Kai Sierra, so. I mean, for us, testing Adobe applications is not within the scope of our team. Um, what we do if our users need Adobe apps is they talk to our software licensing folks who sets them up with a Creative Cloud uh, subscription. At that point, it's through the, uh, the desktop app to install. So patching and updating is on Adobe. Um, so if something's not working right, we do our best and we wait for the next Adobe update. Do you uh, manage uh, video conferencing as well? Like, and what do you use in terms of a platform for that if you do? Manage is such a strong word. Um, <laughs> so the answer for that is that we use uh, Skype for Business. Um, we also use uh, internally, we use Slack and Microsoft Teams where we licensed both. And the decision was made that basically whatever individual teams within SAP want to use, great. You want to use Slack, great. You want to use Teams, great. And within Teams and Slack, they each have their own uh, video conferencing abilities. So primarily we use Skype. Um, I understand that that's eventually going to be shading into Microsoft Teams as I understand it, but right now it's Skype for Business. Um, All right, two minutes. Your final chance for questions. Two minutes. Um, can I ask a question about Apple TVs? Um, you use Apple TVs uh, for what exactly? What, what's the purpose? And also, like, we're testing a solution called Dido, I think. It's like to screen share for PCs and Macs. Mm -hmm. And since you have like Linux and Macs and Windows, how do you handle like projects and like this? You enforce it into a conference room mode? So for our Windows folks, uh, primarily our Apple TVs are meant to serve as that AirPlay 
endpoint. So for our Mac users, they're able to connect to AirPlay and just have it work. For our Windows folks, I believe we're using an, an alternate solution, but we're not trying to implement a one-size-fits-all solution. We're trying for best-of-breed solutions for our individual platforms. That is really hard for Linux sometimes. And we are down to 10 seconds, so I'm gonna call it there. Thank you all for coming.